everyone. Hello. Good evening. Hi. Good evening. Welcome to Inside the Rookery. Um, uh, at the end of what's been a very packed week for us this week. Um, today we're joined by Mark Gascoigne, which we're really excited about, a world fantasy award-winning publisher behind Asmodee's new Aconite Books imprint. But you may know him from Games Workshop's Black Library, Fighting Fantasy, the namesake behind a certain beloved gnome in our community, and um, many more <laughs> things. Perhaps more on that later. Um, as always, um, hi to anyone watching um, afterwards on YouTube. If you're watching live, please do, as always, pop your comments and your questions in the chat and I'll bring them up on screen. And um, yep, Seagoat says gnomes are the best. We agree. Um, and we have a number of pre-submitted questions, as always, from our Patreon community, which we will um, start off with. So welcome to the show, to Andy, to Marco and to Graham. Shall Hello. we get started? So first question came in from Soon. Um, out of all the projects you've worked on over the years, what do you look on back on the most fondly and what was the big one that got away? Oh, goodness. When I um, when I was looking at the uh, pre-submitted questions, I saw that one and thought, I hope she doesn't ask me that one first. <laughs> uh, because the, as one looks back, you know, I, um, I started working at Games Workshop. I worked for Workshop twice, but I started at Games Workshop in um, Easter 1984. So between then and now, I've worked constantly in fantasy gaming, in book publishing around the edge of comics and uh, computer games, and all kind of all points between in the worlds of fantasy gaming and, and publishing. So as you can imagine, over those, there's quite a few things that have uh, uh, given me great uh, satisfaction, but also uh, things that, uh, as I say, slip through the fingers. Um, I have to say that if people ask me what the best thing I ever worked on was, I always say the Sonic Hedgehog novels. I secretly wrote with James <laughs> Wallace, who you'll have seen a couple of nights back, and Carl Sargent, the late Carl Sargent. And uh, that came about because uh, the new publishing director at uh, Virgin Books had acquired the rights. There was a chap called Peter Darvel Evans, who's still out there. He's uh, ex Games Workshop. He was head of sales at Games Workshop. He was Jervis Johnson's boss the day I met Jervis back in the London days. Uh, working for Steve Jackson in Livingston. And uh, he came to us and said, oh, I'd been doing some freelance stuff, as had James. He's like, oh, do you know anything about Sonic the Hedgehog? I need four novels done in about eight weeks. Um, <laughs> and we're like, yeah, we'll do those, because you never said no to anything as freelance writers. And mm. uh, I gathered the boys. We uh, we had a nice long lunch. We, we came up with a bunch of concepts like, oh, detective stories, outer space, time travel, uh, horror movies, all sorts of things. And we whittled them down to maybe six, seven ideas, sent them in, and they said, yeah, write those four. So uh, we plotted them out. Uh, James and Carl wrote them. I rewrote them, uh, put gags into Carl's, took jokes out of James's, and because uh, there were far too many, and uh, we got them in. And then Virgin sold the whole lot to uh, uh, an equivalent of the Scholastic Book Club, and we didn't make a penny. I think uh, I think James had 14 extra pounds out of it, and I had seven extra pounds for one of the volumes. They did also come out in Portugal in lovely little hardbacks with little flicker book Sonic the Hedgehog. So when you riffled the pages, Sonic and Tails span in the corner. Um, we did get a very nice note from the... Uh, the CEO of Virgin at the time, who'd been reading one to his uh, his child at home, I can't remember, uh, son or daughter, and he realised that we had put in jokes for the grown-ups as well <laughs> and sent us a, a very complimentary note. I suspect it was the one James wrote that includes a uh, thinly veiled homage to the Kennedy assassination through uh, one of the uh, one of the little incidents with Sonic and Tails uh, <laughs> trying to rescue a friend of theirs from a floating hover platform. But... Uh, my favourite of all of them was the one that Carl and I worked on, which I, uh, I'm going to have to remember which one it is, but uh, whichever one of the four it was that uh, Martin Adams was our pseudonym for those, uh, involves the evil Dr Eggman, uh, Dr Robotnik, deciding that he would capture Sonic once and for all by setting up a fake film shoot in the uh, pleasant little <laughs> valley of creatures. And so he recruits all of uh, his woodland friends to be stars of these films and shoots a horror movie, which just meant that we could have a whole bunch of um, 
scenes in which Sonic and Tails stumble through this, what they assume is a real horror film, and being faced by their friends, a pig who, of course, has nails in his face like Pinhead from Hellraiser, <laughs> we opened with, because we're not going to mess about on this. <laughs> Quite right, um, <laughs> yeah. The bunny turns up in a big Jason mark with a ma mask with a massive chainsaw and so on and so forth. So um, this is a very not suitable for work, but we are an uh, an adult show. So I follow. Um, it used to be a forum. I mean, it's still a forum, but I get a weekly email from a group called Pop Bitch. I don't know if anyone. Yes, has totally. To that. Yeah, no Pop yeah. Bitch. Well, did you ever get any of the letters that the Pop Bitch um, audience reports getting Sonic slash fic? We don't, though. I know James has recently done an interview with uh, with one of the Sonic fan groups about this specialist Phenomenal. corner, yeah. the Sonic fiction and the Sonic game books. James did a, a couple of game books as well. And myself and Jonathan Green wrote, if you know Jonathan, who's one of the game book specialists still. Uh, Interestingly, we wrote... speaking to Jonathan right this very second on Facebook. Oh, as we speak. Well, yeah, Perfect timing. Summon him and he, <laughs> shall, re timing. he shall emerge. Um, yeah, indeed. So we did number five and six, and a couple of chaps uh, did did a couple in the middle, which I edited. Because uh, again, as with gaming and as with uh, fantasy publishing, uh, the game book line, there's only, well, we say there's 12 people in publishing and you meet them all the time. There's only six in game books. Mm. Um, Graham, didn't you do game books as well? You wrote some choose your well, when, fantasy stuff. Yes, yes. When you were editing Warlock, I did a, a bunch of articles, mainly for the, the RPG version. But uh, I wrote one short adventure that got published in Warlock, 200 entries, and made it into the 10th anniversary yearbook. Indeed, and, the little diary thing. Uh, I knew that uh, you'd played yeah. a significant part in that. And uh, I wrote one all by myself, uh, number 29, Midnight Rogue, the sort of thiefy one. Yep. Um, but that was, that was about the extent of it for game books for me. Well, I do look back fondly to answer Soon's question vaguely on those days. Um, Steve and Ian, of course, had been the progenitors of this. And yes, you can see the trails going into it, uh, Tunnels and Trolls and so on. But they, they did the most amazing thing by taking gaming into not just the mainstream, but the young mainstream, which meant that we were recruiting. And you talk to people these days. And whereas perhaps Graham and myself and uh, came in through early D&D &D and Traveller and games like that, those first basic sets, and we had to puzzle it out, and White Dwarf was a massive help, eventually getting copies of Dragon and ultimately Imagine magazine from TSR UK, Fighting Fantasy recruited the next wave. There's, uh, mm -hmm. there's a whole nice. wave of people now in their 40s and 50s who mm. came in through that. Some of them got into advanced fighting fantasy, which uh, you know, I worked on. But however they came in, they came in. Well, thank you very much. Big much hand. Busy. Look at that. I was yeah. prepared. <laughs> Good yeah. stuff. Um, and um, the, the fighting fantasy experience. You know, I was already working at Workshop. I'd, uh, well, I started in fanzines. Myself, a guy called Ian Marsh, who was uh, fairly soon after we left university, uh, White Wolf editor. Uh, these days running a miniatures company, Fighting Fifteens uh, from Isle of Wight, and a chap called Mike Lewis, uh, who has uh, actually in his day done a lot of stuff in computer games and, again, is a, a historical miniatures guy um, these days. We founded a fanzine at, at school, and we mm -hmm. just uh, – we took the piss out of Games Workshop because how could you not, really? Mm -hmm. uh, except everyone else was going, "Oh no, don't rock the boat!" Yeah, we're doing, we're doing, uh, you know, proper little monsters and uh, treasure yeah. trap stuff. Basically, everyone was trying to be White Dwarf, and we were mm -hmm. the only yeah. way we would ever reference White Dwarf would be doing a fake article in the style mm -hmm. that they did, uh, yeah. going on about Ian Livingston's uh, hair curlers of plus two dexterity or whatever. It was all fairly puerile stuff. But then we were <laughs> 17, 18 years old. Well, we didn't know any better. And of course, what Ian did when I popped out of university was immediately give me a job to shut me up uh and he'd done much the same for for ian who uh he ian had gone to work in the warehouse because uh well actually because he was innumerate and uh, the rest of us all got jobs in game center the well-known <laughs> games chain but he'd never had a, a saturday job in a shop so they said yeah what 17 times 39 and he had no idea so he went and got a job in the warehouse at workshop instead and when uh an assistant editor job came up. Well, of course, he was the obvious one, another editor of Dragon Lords, another one of those ghastly oiks from Kent. And uh, Joe Diva 
had been offered some game book contracts because people used to go to Stephen Inn. I told you at the start, I just talked, don't I? Uh, so, uh, <laughs> As I said, I'm looking forward to this. I hope you have to do yeah. that myself. <laughs> Hopefully you're mapping, mapping the connections and I will use a semicolon at some point to at least pause in the uh, in the great gush of stuff. There's a lot of this out there. I, I don't know if you're aware that Stephen Ian are assembling a, a book about the early days of Games Workshop that mm -hmm. uh, many of us have uh, supplied memories, both good and bad and unprintable, uh, to it. And hopefully at least some of them will make it in. Stephen Ian did Fighting Fantasy. Everyone else went, oh, these are good and they're selling millions. Could you write some for us? And, of course, they couldn't uh, because they're under contract to Penguin and that was working very well. But people like Joe Diva, John Sutherland, various other folks in the team were yeah. offered these things. Oh, go and talk to Joe, our game developer. So that's where Lone Wolf came from. Joe then uh, – they waved a lot of cash under his nose, and quite rightly, he uh, he uh, he moved on to become a freelance writer. So there was a job for a game editor. But I didn't know this because when Ian moved out of the warehouse to work on White Dwarf, there was a job sweeping up in the warehouse at Sunbeam Road. And uh, I applied for it, and I was sitting in reception filling in a form. And Ian came through, did a, the, the best comedy double take I've ever seen outside of a Buster Keaton movie. And uh, he said, who let you in? Security, security, and all this stuff. Yeah, very funny guy. Um, um, he tells it much the same way uh, these days. But uh, um, he said, oh, uh, what are you in for? So oh, I'm applying for a job. Well, I didn't know you were looking for something. So, yeah, you, you remember Game Center went bust and uh, it's time to uh, time to, uh, time to to move on. So he said, well, after you finish talking to the warehouse guy, uh, come and chat to me because I've got, a, I've got a, a vacancy for a games editor as of this morning, uh, which was lucky, I thought. Uh, uh, and so... Uh, I talked to uh, to the head of the warehouse and said I had to go and see Ian. He's like, oh, crap, not again. I've only just lost Ian. And I says, well, what, what can I do? Uh, so uh, I uh, went to see Mr. Livingston. He uh, gave me the first draft of the rule system for something that would become the Judge Dread roleplay game. He says, oh, I'm going to give you half an hour, and I need you to tell me what you'd do to that if you were the developer. So, um, yeah, he, he, it was uh, Rick Priestley's uh, work based uh, on what was becoming the Warhammer system, you know, hints of laser burn and uh, those sort of things. And uh, there were some things missing from the rules, but mostly there was no background. And my big thing really has always been world building. It's what brings it to life. So I said, well, this is all very well. If you put it as a skirmish system, as it currently is, people will play it with the miniatures. But if you want it to be a role play game, as it says in the title, you need a world book, you need characters. And luckily, 2000 AD is rich, overflowing with this, because every week they invent a craze of the week, another new type of bad guy and so on and so forth. Um, and also, you've missed out all the uh, vehicles, so I'll do the rules for those as well. And he went, okay, well, I'll have a think about that. And so um, give me a call in two days' time. So I uh, I uh, had to totter off to my uh, to my little local phone booth in Hackney with the smell of we and the pile of tempes. And he pre he pretended to toss a coin on the phone, the fucker. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> because uh, he, uh, yeah, he needed to get his revenge again for, for various uh, fanzine style japery, and uh, he uh, he offered me the job, and I started and promptly got measles, so I, I didn't come in much for the first three four weeks, but uh, uh, settled in, worked away on the uh, on the Judge Dread role play game, which took a year. Um, I didn't have anything to work on. I had a desk which I was in with Ian Marsh and. Uh, poor sod Jamie Thompson, the then editor of uh, White Dwarf, but noting that he and I had you know, obviously been in school together and shared the same sense of humour, he didn't stand a chance. Um, if we were particularly <laughs> bored, uh, if we were particularly bored, we'd uh, we'd construct uh, seed engines out of office supplies, but that had to stop when Ian managed to shoot a steel ruler through the air conditioning system, and bits of hot metal <laughs> fell on Jamie's head. So uh, we were told off in no uncertain terms then. But great fun, hmm. obviously playing in the, with the best set of toys yeah i was creating stuff for judge dread i didn't even have so much as a typewriter so it was all written freehand uh, oh, wow. for the time being they they bought this very complicated uh, input device but it was an input device for typesetters and it was just a data entry thing much like stenographers use and spent yeah several thousand pounds on this and you if you had correct copy you'd type it in and then run out galley strips to be pasted up pre-dtp all that stuff you know 1984 into 85 um but it was no use to me because it was not even a backspace it was just data entry and yeah steve jackson very upset that they spent a lot of money on this thing it's like why aren't you using it well because it's it's not crap but it's totally unsuitable and look i'm having to write the judge red role play game your big release for next year in in pencil on pads of paper i bring from home so uh, they finally sorted me out but we're pottering away you know doing play testing 
listening to horrendous punk music and throbbing gristle and all sorts of terrible things on the office hi-fi till people asked us to stop and uh, and then going out every night to the local games club at old street in the the pink hippopotamus company i think it used to be called long gone uh, where we'd uh, we'd play test and, and play other board games and things uh, all night long ridiculous uh, dream world an absolute paradise for for you know i was 21 22 uh, doing this sort of stuff and uh, having the time of my life with my buddies uh, no real sense of responsibility whatsoever um and then things have changed well <laughs> <laughs> Has to be, I have to confess that I've only ever do, done two job interviews in my life. One was that chat with the guy from the warehouse, and Ian was already luring me away from that one. And the one was about 20 years later when I was properly freelance. And I was just a bit bored, so I applied to typeset to the student newspaper at Trent Poly here in Nottingham. But unfortunately, I told... Uh, uh, I told them how it should be done, so they didn't want me in the building. So that mm. wasn't going to happen. They didn't know what the hell they were doing. But I've never, other than those, ever had a job interview. I've always just been, oh, you're a clever guy. Come over here. Um, and, of course, what I do, and looking at my, my career, I had three years of Games Workshop the first time and then fell out with the, the Nottingham crew. We'd, we'd had the takeover from Citadel, who the game uh, and the industry itself was moving on, moved up to Nottingham, met wonderful folks like Graham, and uh, fell out big time with the, uh, the Nottingham mm. establishment because I couldn't shut my bloody mouth when I thought things were wrong. I and, don't believe uh, it. <laughs> and they, fact, uh, could I cut in just for a second and say I heard almost exactly the same story from Mike Brunton. Um, yeah, Mike um, and I and Graham were thick as thieves. Graham was far more yeah. grown up than we were. So, but, uh, so just on that note, maybe it's I was time just to quieter. In... I was still having the thoughts. But... <laughs> and, and Paul Coburn, likewise, yeah, he's very much a magazine guy, and realised, you know, after a year and a half, uh, that while his face fit and he was doing great work, that you know, it wasn't going to be long. The, uh, but the, the, the Dale asked, Trotter was... of gaming. Oh. What yes, was what was Graham like as a young man of Games Workshop oh, in comparison to the distinguished gentleman he is? <laughs> I love this question. Well, I'm just sitting back and smile. <laughs> Graham is a couple of years older than me, you can tell that because, you know, I think next year all my hair's just going to go. Uh, but um, Graham's always been the mature adult in the room, which is not to say he doesn't act like a dick from time to which time, is a but certainly back in the day. But... Term, let's, let's, let's yes, let's... Of course. But like us, he's always pursued his passions. So there's always been that that glint in the eye, no matter what he's been doing, which we all share. Because we're like, I can't believe we've got away with this for so long. And look, we're playing with these amazing toys. Um, but no, Graham was always the mature one, very hardworking, very sensible, and quite rightly, you know, a massive safe pair of hands on on things like Woofra. As as Graham, Phil Gallagher, Jim Bambra, uh, and uh, various uh, assistants were working on. Well, I'm a fantasy role play. Myself and Mike Brunton were kind of running everything else mm -hmm. to the extent that when Woofrup was delivered, that very first edition of the of the massive rule book, the amazing cutaway diagrams, all that rich atmosphere screaming out of uh, Tony Ackland and other folks' artwork, uh, I refused to go next door and drink the champagne with them. So I'm, no, you bastards, you've been all been doing one product. <laughs> I've got six board games, 12 issues of White Dwarf and six, six issues of Warlock out between me and Mike, and we're really pissed off with you a lot of course after 20 minutes we realized that there was free champagne next door we're being rather silly so uh, we of course went and indulged but uh, but they were they were pioneering days and everything was being done for the first time and i think if anything's changed since then i think the things that have perhaps gone away to some extent is the fact that uh, the industry is so codified. It's got a heritage. We've got old timers like me talking about a, a silver age and the golden age mm -hmm. of the Gygaxes and Arnesons and so on. And many more ages. Before. So, you know, it's not two generations ago. It's five and six generations. Mm -hmm. And the tools are easier there, but there's a, there's less ability to make stuff up for the first time. On yeah. the other hand, everything that people produce, and I follow fanzines, there's a Nottingham fanzine launching this weekend through Dice Cut, which is a wonderful actual printed magazine, and uh, hurrah for them. It's that they can do it so much better than we did. Mm -hmm. um, I used to be so petty, I'd even harangue people if they didn't use a ruler to draw the lines in their fanzine and stuff. Like, come on, we're better than this, we're better than this. Uh, and, of course, we used to organise the, the Games Day fanzine tables and things and make sure that you know, we would, uh, we'd share uh information and support and build a little cartel because no one was going to do it for us and uh i suspect that's one of the reasons why we got on as well you know we knew what we were doing yeah right uh but if it worked we did it again and if it didn't well we uh we kept quiet about it 
But uh, and that's kept that's kept going for the last forty years as well. To be honest. Yeah. So Roderick has a question. Um, there's a lot of Wifrip and and mm. W fans. Um, if you could just stick your oar into the river of time and fundamentally change <laughs> something in GW's IP forever to more to better suit mm. your taste, what would it be? Well, I think this is the plot of next week's Doctor Who, isn't it? Actually, so uh, I think that that's that's going to happen. But uh, yeah, yeah. My my interaction with Warhammer and and Woofrup, uh, wonderful as it is, was as I say, uh, the first time out with my three years at workshop. The first time in the eighties was me grumbling in a corner while everyone ex got excited by it. Um, mm. Second time out, my interaction has very much been on the IP side uh, from Black Library, because as a, I'm not a war gamer, I started as a war gamer pre D and D, playing with minifix mythical Earth figures. They definitely weren't orcs oh. and Gandalf or anything. You know, um, white haired wizard on on horseback was definitely not Gandalf or anything. And so, of course, as role play turned up, we were able to use those minis in our games and eventually Dungeons and Dragons and Traveller and everything. Actually, Shivery Sorcery, the first one, we we moved from that very rapidly. That was money well wasted. Uh, as we realized that you could die during character creation because it was so realistic. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Right, start again. Um, but uh, Warhammer, for me, has always been a world, not a game mm. system and so on. Mm. And it's something that I, I bang on about in my current day job with Aconite, dealing with a lot of Asmodee IPs, also working with Marvel and Ubisoft and a bunch of folk you won't have heard about yet, uh, which is that we pretend that the world is real and that there are some games based on this real world. And there are also some books and comics and computer games and movies and so on based on this real world. And Warhammer, the trick has always been to find the stories. Warhammer Fantasy Battle was a little moribund. It was a great excuse to build huge armies and set elves against Arthurian knights or against more pikemen types or uh, whatever. And the chaos stuff was very rich and redolent. Yes, uh, echoing Moorcock, but bringing its own style to it. But there wasn't a lot of history happening and there weren't characters. But when you get down into role play, suddenly there's Gotrick and Felix hacking their way through stuff. There's uh, yeah, yeah. thieves and witch hunters and kings and emperors and chaos cultists and, of course, mad gibbering skaven under everything. And suddenly it comes to life. And we were so – well, we – the first Black Library books on the Warhammer side, we had to base them on role play subjects because we weren't allowed to change the history. These days, of course, they've taken very strong and brave decisions with the Age of Sigmar and so on to reset, but also build storytelling into their new their new epoch or their old epoch, as it were, with young Gotrek and so on. Uh, Gotrek babies, I think, would be next, won't it? But uh, um, <laughs> it'll be uh, yeah, we'll have to go, but some way four or five hundred years back in time. But I bet he was a git from the from the from the very start, wasn't he? <laughs> but uh but so for me that, maybe maybe let's go to Kilishandra's question what what was the greatest achievement of black library in your time i'm i'm going to be polite which is that <laughs> what, what, because to be honest well actually i'm not going to be polite then am i i'm obviously obviously <laughs> dangling that thread <laughs> you know what black library was was an afterthought black library was a bit of an experimental wing of GW founded by Rick Priestley and Andy Jones, who actually, when they first came and talked to me, I'd been doing some freelance work with them. Andy was kind of special projects guy and a bit like, well, he does amazing things, but stick him in the cupboard and keep him away from everything else. So he doesn't break that. But he was, you know, things like Warhammer Quest had come out and there's an introductory game. The troll games had sprung out of his creativity. Oh, yeah. They're insane children's games, four of them with a, a mad little cassette of goblins singing. That you, trolls, uh, trolls, uh, trolls, trolls. Exactly so. And yeah. uh, goblins in the pantry and, and all those sort of things. Um, but he was doing these amazing ideas that were in some cases fueling activity in other cases a bit of a distraction from the main absolute edifice of workshop which is making toy soldiers to play warhammer and, and, and 40k uh, and quite right too and let's be honest that's where the money lies and always has done mm. but uh, they weren't getting much purchase so i uh, on studio time so i was helping andy out uh, which uh, Jervis had reminded him of my existence. And they were like, oh, are we sure? We sacked him the last time. Oh, we allowed him out again. Yeah, he's fine. He's a grown-up. And I was-ish. Uh, um, but the first thing they wanted me to do was just work on a Blue Peter annual for Warhammer. Now, for those of you, particularly overseas, you, you may be aware of Blue Peter, which is like a, a uh, multi-topic magazine show for children. Uh, quite posh, quite bbc -y. Um, <clears throat> this week, we're going to show you how to make a model of the, uh, the uh, fourth uh, fourth road bridge using only these cereal packets and some yogurt pots. 
and a lot of sticky back plastic, which is a yep. substance no one uh, after 1954 was familiar with. But apparently, Blue Peter had endless supplies of it. I think Biddy Backstrad shares in it, didn't she? Um, <laughs> and what we wanted to do was uh, their like collected out for Christmas book. Uh, which in their case would be some of the build stories of uh, Florence Nightingale and how the Red Cross was founded. And here's a picture of one of our presenters climbing Nelson's column and getting involved. With. We mm -hmm. want to do the same for Warhammer with shots of miniatures, how to paint and convert, but also here's a cutaway through a dwarf fortress. And here's here's how to uh, write things in elf runes and fiction and comic books and all those things bundled together. And that very quickly became Inferno. Inferno. And uh, it was compromised by the fact that Actually, we could do one or we could do it as a magazine. And actually, we kind of missed the time to do the Christmas thing. So, well, let's try it as a magazine. And we put it out in this weird digest format. But in the first issue, there were stories. Actually, I think a comic strip first by one D. Abnett. I don't know if anyone's familiar with him. Whatever happened to him. Um, and... Uh, <laughs> There was the first episodes of Malice Starblade comic strip. There was a Gaunt's Ghost stories on the way. There was a new Gotrick and Felix story by the wonderful Bill King and so on and so forth. And cutaway diagrams from Ralph Horsley and on and on. And, and although the format was all wrong, it was a, the most amazing kind of like a demo tape of what became one a monthly comic, all the novels and short story books, and eventually the art books and the background books and so on and so forth. But Games Workshop didn't know what to make of it. And even by the time the novels were, were, were happening, we were overhearing the sales teams going, well, it's not really official or anything. And it turned out they, they had a sales bonus on selling Warhammer. And if they sold Black Library stuff, even the novels, they'd lose money out of their pay packet. So they were <laughs> telling people that we were crap and that we weren't, uh, we weren't, it's not proper Warhammer, you know, no, it's some license. We don't really know what it is. We were in the next bloody room to them and we heard them saying this. We managed to get it sorted out. So the greatest achievement is actually slowly but surely turning the whole of Games Workshop on its axis so they understand not that the stories drive the games because more than anything they're about the amazing adventure of miniatures on the tabletop and nothing will ever challenge the fact that if you spent two, three, four hundred pounds much, much more on an army you don't want the story changing to then screw this up uh, which is why people still go on about Zotes and Space Dwarves and things because they've still oh, yeah. got some and they wanted to play with them and they learned quite a strong lesson from taking them out of the game that they shouldn't do that again um introducing a new army is okay but you don't have too much of that too much escalation. so warham has to sit there but the fiction can give you all the stories that give you a purpose for these battles and then it feeds back into role play but also now into eisenhorn potentially going into a tv show there's mm -hmm. movies the computer games sprang very strongly both from the game but also the storylines from the novels and of course there were then tie-in stories that then fed back out and so on so the biggest uh, achievement with an asterisk on it, because I'm going to come to the second best one, uh, is actually making story and world and miniatures more in balance, where it's not just a setting, but stories are being told with characters, people live <coughs> and breathe with them, wake I'm up. I'm going to cut in, <coughs> just for a moment, to um, compound upon the point that um, was being made there. At this time, I was working in the shops. Mm. Um, I was um, working in the Edinburgh store, uh, way up in uh, where I am here now. And I remember when Inferno first came out and exactly the situation that Marco describes is what came up. Everyone was very much a, what the fuck? Um, because it was something that had been seen as a previous Games Workshop thing, the focusing on story. Um, mm -hmm. It was what was done beforehand and had been sort of, not so much forgotten, but was certainly sidelined. Um, yeah. mm -hmm. But it sold in gangbusters. Um, and people were talking about it in the way that they weren't talking about the models uh, mm -hmm. because it was a story. It was something they could engage with. Um, and it then began to reflect about six months later in many of the games that were being played uh, because people were wanting to reproduce the stories or to reenact things that they had seen, whether it was a big battle or whether it was something similar. Like, uh, Ralph, Hol uh, Ralph Hosley cutaway is a classic example of something that people yeah. would like to replicate. Um, and it was, uh, from our perspective as, show as store runners, gold. Because it meant that when we had weekly games to, to conjure up from nowhere, we had this great mind that we could drop into, get some nuggets out of, throw yeah. them back at the customers, and away they went. So When someone in UK trade sales had converted some Imperial Guards, some Cadians, I think, into Gaunt's Ghost the Tanith, and put little capes on and the tiny little broken three dagger badges on them, that's it, we've won, we yeah. knew. Yeah, uh, I agreed completely. And it, 
what it did is there's one last point was it um instead of where the role play uh side of it always brought up individual stories it was always about the story that you made and thus the unit that you wanted to make from your story it yeah. basically homogenized that out to everybody so instead of it's just your story it's everyone's story and everyone wants to make Gaunt's Ghost, for example. Um, so and then led... question here. Can we just answer this yes, question? Yes, Jackie Over was pre BL. Yeah, was pre uh, yeah. yeah um, the Nottingham Citadel crew uh, in the mid 80s had experimented with fiction, understanding the story, particularly mm. since that was the golden age of the first round of Worm of Fantasy roleplay. And they hired among the best talents in British. Yeah. SF Publishing, which was uh, Dave Pringle, the editor of Interzone, which is kind of yep. the, uh, the British yep. equivalent of Asimov's. And he hired all his mates. Some of them made it into it amazingly. Kim Newman certainly did, and uh, he gets it. Ian Watson with his demented Inquisitor books. Oh, um, yeah. And uh, lovely Ian. And you know, it's wonderful that BL was able to bring those back. Uh, and then some missed the mark. But then at the same time, 40K and Woofrup were still formative. And there oh, were, yeah, very there were much. missteps and blind alleys. Yeah. Mm. And as I remember, uh, Bill King was was in house running that fiction line when it first started, as well as writing the early mm. Felix and Gotrek. Doesn't mm. surprise me. Up. Certainly, he was among the best of the coaches. But you look at some of the names in those early anthologies. Charles Stross published his first ever stories, and he mm. one of the absolute gods of uh, British uh, cerebral sci-fi. Uh, there were names like John Brunner, the late uh, John wow. Brunner, mm. and. Uh, 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 David Ferring, which is uh, David, David uh, uh, Brian Craig was Brian Stableford, and, and right. many other folks, some of the biggest names. Mm -hmm. uh, Storm Constantine uh, was in the uh, the early anthologies. Uh, Nicola Griffith, the Canadian writer, a bunch of others. Uh, I haven't remembered all of these, but uh, but many. This next question, though, is really ties into that. Is yeah. what, if anything, is distinctly British about the properties? I say this a lot. War, Warhammer is absolutely quintessential the European approach to fantasy. Now, yeah. uh, the house I live in, I'm in a house that's only 13 years old, so a typical American kind of house, though I'm in Nottingham in the UK. Um, but beneath me is the remains of a Victorian rail yard, and beneath that <laughs> is a 17th century bow, bone field from the cattle uh, slaughtering house and leather working that was beneath that. And beneath that is almost certainly something Saxon and beneath that is something Roman. Mm. Mm. Europe is layer upon layer of the filth of history. Yeah. And Warhammer got it all out. It was a game of lepers and disease and chaos and filth. American mm. fantasy is clean Hollywood fantasy. It's golden locks and mighty warriors. We know That's who the right. heroes. Oh, and there's a castle 20 miles away and the necromancers live there. What, and you've not risen up and killed the bastard? He's kill He's taken all your bodies. Oh, we'd better go and get him. Whereas everything in Warhammer and everything in other British fantasy uh, things mm. is filthy with history. And yeah. it has that sense of it. And mm. that's great. The other thing that Warhammer did particularly was it was full of uh, Rick and Hal's most appalling puns, which people like Graham and... <laughs> Uh, Chaz Elliott and so on continued. Yeah. Um, they used to piss me off. That was far too childish for me. Uh, back uh, back in the day, these days, it's like how you got away with some of this stuff is just mm. tremendous. And of course, American fans still have no idea that uh, you know in Lustria, <laughs> the town of Skeggy, founded by these dwarves, is is a you know a port on the sea run by dwarves and so on. They'd yeah. never heard of Skegness on the Lincolnshire coast, where people no. like Rick were dragged for their holidays, dismal rain and sleet lash things. <laughs> Uh, yeah. in the 70s. I was at an American convention a while ago and saw some uh, orc players raising up the Here We Go chant, and they had no idea that it was <laughs> supposed to be to the tune of Stars and Stripes Forever. <laughs> <laughs> Stars oh, and Stripes dear. Forever is what bands play if they want to tell everyone in the company that a theatre needs to be evacuated, but they don't want to scare the audience. I didn't That's know why that. we sang them. Yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Faced with a bunch yes. of London soccer hooligans chanting, Here we, Here we go. go. Yeah. Here we Evacuation. Go in any sense is the uh, the right uh, right response well you couldn't you couldn't have a gang of orcs shouting you're going to get your fucking head kicked in uh, or anything like that though <laughs> i've heard that chanted across a few tabletops as well not in print anyway no <laughs> no not in print <laughs> uh, it's all very gentlemanly at the tournaments as well i'm sure but uh, sure um Did... so oh sorry no um... i just uh, favorite fighting fantasy book i didn't write that's quite simple creature of havoc steve jackson's mm -hmm. book 
I think it's, yes. it's, I don't know what number it is. Uh, it's not number 13 because that's House of Hell, which is the other really groovy one where you're actually you're mm -hmm. basically ta taking part in a satanic ritual. It got denounced by Vickers on the lunchtime news book. on the BBC News. Creature of Havoc wins its place on my pile. And I I was uh, editor of the range for, for eight and a half, nine years. So I, a lot of the last numbers between about, I think, 31 and 59, I had to take apart on my living room floor and chart on massive bits of paper and so on. So I'm very familiar with them. Uh, but Creature of Havoc wins the kudos because you wake up inside an unfamiliar body, not able to speak, and everything that people say to you is in code because it's all muffled. It's a bit like a bomb's gone off and you're muted, actually, a bit like trying to do a, a vidcast in the headphones. But uh, um, slowly but surely you learn clues to what some of the words you've done and then you can actually go back and read it and the mm -hmm. one thing wrong with creature of havoc is there's a printing mistake in it and one of the clues is wrong and a lot of people weren't able to get past it which it was it was uh, sorted out later but uh, but because of the epic uh ambition uh, that steve brought to it six or seven books into it he wasn't resting as long as he'd done things like sorcery that came with its own four book set and people have gone beyond things like uh, uh dave morris's 12 book set where he went off the side of one book and joined the next book and so on extraordinary but uh but creature of havoc for me remains a pinnacle agreed completely it was the one that won me over forever it's just a gorgeous book and i'm, I'm not going to say too much about it but in my current job, I am dabbling with some game book stuff, uh, oh, which wow. we'll, be we'll be talking about in the spring, uh, because they haven't gone away. Uh, and again, you know, people who've mm -hmm. grown up with fighting fantasy, relishing the chance to uh, mm -hmm. to uh, to dive in and out and play with these things. It's been great listening to the uh, Grognard Files playing advanced fighting fantasy in the last few issues and talking to Ian Livingston about the glory days. And uh, it's part of our DNA that choose your own yeah, adventure stuff. Is. Yeah, now I'm seeing quite a renaissance with online magazines and, and mm -hmm. people introducing their kids to the fighting fantasy books they loved mm. as children. Well, you, that Black Mirror episode, Bandersnatch, that's mm -hmm. because Charlie Brooker played yeah. fighting fantasy. Uh, mm. it's, uh, there's a direct line through all of this stuff. Mm. Uh, we agree about Creature of Havoc. Thank you, Seagoat. <laughs> mm -hmm. The wise seagoat. Um, where did I go? I have lost my question here. It is seagoat. Favorite monster oh, from out of the pit. Coincidentally, yeah. What's oh, your favorite monster from out of the pit? Out of the pit. Now that was the first fighting fantasy book I wrote, and that was very much Ian coming to me and saying, "Well, Joe Diva's busy doing Lone Wolf, and John Sutherland and Min are gone off doing this game book, and uh, Jamie's got his own uh, uh, game book range, and so on and so forth. But I need someone to collect these monsters into a book and add a few." Uh, add a few. Uh, it was only 80, 80, 80, 85, 90% uh, new content. <coughs> but the thing I remember about that is uh, I told him that I wouldn't work without a signed contract. And when that was signed and I'd had a bit of advance money, I'd then buy myself uh, a table to work on at home because I didn't have a table and a chair and so on and so forth. I was living this post student life. And he was telling Penguin that I was almost finished writing. So I got into big trouble with them and then wrote it all in about six weeks. And, you know, towards the end, I was inventing monsters at the rate of about one every 20 minutes. Um, so, frankly, I have no idea. Um, it's not a book I've dove into much since, if I'm being honest, whereas Titan, the book that followed it, the Fighting mm -hmm. Fantasy World book. Um, I know I'm going to sound a bit conceited, but that was among the best things I ever did as a creative yeah, it was, person. It was one of the best world books of its time. I'd say and one that's constantly referenced as well by those that yeah. know it. Mm. Um, I wanted to put in it. Was done. Mm. I wanted to put in something that made it feel like a living world, yeah. which considering it had to squeeze in things that were from Stephen Ian, but also the third party books, including some of the plainly set in Japan books and things <laughs> are in yeah. different dimensions. It was mashed together. But then a lot of fantasy does bring in these influences. I'm Warhammer itself, Warhammer. you know, with between yeah. the Bretonians and the Orcs and the Chaos and the Tolkien stuff and so on and so forth. Um, but I, I knew that I wanted to do cutaways to elf tree cities and through a dwarf citadel and put in runes and codes and language. Everything that I loved about fantasy worlds was there. Uh, and again, that was a, that was a hard one. I'd started work properly at Games Workshop up in Nottingham, but I took two weeks off to write it. But where I was basically right, typing all day and then I'd go to bed with a pad and draw my diagrams and wake up two or three in the morning with my face on the pad and then this was pre-email, so I had to go in, you know, I just had a hard stop for a finished manuscript in two weeks' time and just blam this through. So I'm sure some of it is quite hallucinogenic. 
But the one thing we got access to working with Peng, uh, Penguin, because Puffin was part of Penguin, was uh, a very classical editor called Roger Wells, who sadly is no longer with us. His main gig was doing things like the Penguin Encyclopedia of Jazz, where he knew everything about obscure Miles Davis sides from the 50s and 60s. Um, but he was also let loose on our manuscripts. So whatever we did, he would clean it up. Uh, the downside of that was six months after printing, they'd send you your, in those days, printed out manuscript with all his red ink on it. And, oh, my God, he must have gone through some pe boxes of pens with me. But uh, <laughs> it's great learning, and I did take it apart and learn how to be an editor from what Roger and other folks did. And it stood me in good stead later. I got into a habit with Penguin of being the guy they rang up if they wanted a book very quickly. I did a book on Polks. Anyone remember Polks? I kind do. of stackable card things you hit with a plastic dobber. Uh, that became a craze in the middle of the summer of whenever it was, 87, 88. And it was 11 days between, do you know anything about Polks to the book going to the printers? And I had a birthday in the middle, which was good because I could go to the pub for three hours and calm down. And I knew nothing about Pogs and still don't. So three quarters of it was invented. All these variant games, these classes of Pogs, poison Pogs, healer Pogs. None of it exists. Uh, and I can tell you this now, but if, if you want to look for Pog Off, uh, <laughs> the unofficial guide to milk cat games, uh, Penguin Books 2.99, uh, then, then that was groovy. But we started doing those. And the, the downside of those was my editor would come to Nottingham on the last day of writing and edit the books in front of me. The wonderful <laughs> Richard, the wonderful Richard Scrivener, if you're out there, Rich. And uh, that's a way to uh, realize your ego and your thoughts about how much that talent you actually have account for nothing. Mm. And bizarrely, I practice that same ego death with all my staff and always have done. <laughs> but, uh, he, we will correct your work in front of you and you will learn, uh, alas. Um, yeah, it's uh, yeah, it parallels with a perhaps a Zen compound or sweeping up until you learn how to do kung fu and so on, but uh, in a in a more nerdy sense. But uh, they were great fun, and we did uh, out of that came the investigators' handbooks. I did a bit. I did a book about proving to children that ghosts don't exist, and then another one proving that UFOs don't exist and that all parents lie. And uh, unfortunately, the third one, dinosaurs, I couldn't prove dinosaurs didn't exist because plainly they do, or did. Uh, but uh, I wanted to do a fourth fourth one doing organized religion and they wouldn't let me oh, but, uh, that's, uh, oh that would have been beautiful yeah indeed yes. <laughs> the god investigator's handbook well sorry to say it's a lovely idea and yeah the simple-minded will take great comfort but um <laughs> it's what the ufo book said uh and obviously uh couldn't possibly comment but uh oh, yeah. obviously <laughs> um, so there's a question from kilishandra um what traits does a story need pinned down to be spooky that's a how oh. tangential Halloween question. Ah, well, I'm dressed for Halloween. Quite today. rightly, quite rightly so. Um, oh, we assume we dress like that every day, and quite, <laughs> quite rightly so. Um, she is. For me, the the thing that makes any story spooky is actually something that threatens what you hold dear. And uh, I'm kicking myself because I was going to go and remind myself of the title uh, of Thomas Ligotti's opening story in Songs of a Dead Dream. I think it's called Spree. And it's about a, a prison governor or a justice of the peace kind of attorney who's put away a serial killer. And one dark night, he's rung up by the killer who says, where's your daughter? No, she isn't. And... I, as I was talking to Lindsay and Andy about their kids and, and mine, I've got a teenage daughter right now. And that story is like an absolute dagger straight into the heart of everything I hold dear. And I've worked a lot in taking stories apart over time. And I find that out and out horror stories have to work very hard to make me feel spooked. Mm. So for me, they have to be ultra realistic and really threatening the chaos that would really hurt us if it really hit us. You know, it's more like something like Cormac McCarthy's The Road, which, again, I also have a teenage son. And, oh, my God, I cannot bear just – I can't bear to think about the experience of reading that book because although, it, yeah, we hope it'll never happen, we are only, you know, two power cuts and a, a, a couple more deliveries of uh, – missed deliveries of milk and toilet paper, and uh, we'll be there, I think. Yeah, and we've I, all I, had a taste of that. With me, that that to be spooky, it also needs. So those two tell you something about yourself. They tell you something about what you fear. One mm. one of the books that has stayed with me for the past couple of years is, and I can't remember who it's by, 
the power Naomi Alderman maybe yep, and, it is, yep. yeah yeah she's a big fighting fantasy fan by the way oh, I met her, oh. met her in the street with James Wallace a few years ago she says oh my god you did fighting fantasy she was bowing down to me in the street like, whoa <laughs> wait here you did yeah. zombies run and you've just written this amazing uh Whitbread prize winning novel and yeah. all this sort of stuff the power stuck with me and it was because of how uncomfortable I felt reading it when not to, I don't want to give anything away it's a great book please do read it but the way men were treated in that book made me so uncomfortable and and there's a bit of a flip in the book and it and it made me realize a lot about internalized misogyny and things everyday sexism that we accept and I'm a feminist and I run a women's network and like you won't meet a a more um feminist person than me in some ways but it's still I couldn't get over how much more uncomfortable I was reading that than I was reading the same things happening to women mm -hmm. and I was horrified and it stuck with me and I gave it to someone else to read and I said to him and he was like didn't really affect me at all I mean it was fine speculative it's really interesting because it's speculative fiction but the fiction itself is speculative about the past like it's got this weird loop in it he mm. was like yeah it's fine and it really made me like open my eyes and think oh wow it didn't affect you like it affected me because it didn't tell you something about yourself and it told me something about myself that i wasn't ready to examine as a man he hasn't lived in an occupied territory with an oppressor if, I, yeah. if that's not too yeah. strong a thing to say yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 We, as men, we have no knowledge of this, and we can see a little bit. Uh, my partner is Asian, and I've, I've certainly seen some of the racism she gets. But as a young woman and as an older woman, you know, I don't see three quarters of what she sees day in day out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and never will do. Yeah, I spent the whole book thinking my first thought: thinking, don't like stop treating him like that. Stop treating him <laughs> like that. And and actually. If I read no, a book where women were treated like that, it would just be normal. Hmm. Well, he's it a man. He deserves it, to be honest. So we need to get to that point. <laughs> yeah. um, Randall says it didn't affect me either. I was much more disconcerted by The Handmaid's Tale. Mm. I mean, yeah, that's... Isn't it, isn't it wonderful and horrible that The Handmaid's Tale has moved into proper popular culture so yeah. everyone knows what a handmaiden is, everyone is watching it, and uh, people are going to learn. And, you know, it's taken a while to catch up with that and other people's visions. But it is, you know, it's part of our culture now that mm. this level of oppression is within our grasp and, of course, is mm -hmm. being reimposed in some countries of this world as we speak. Oh, yeah. But it's, yeah. you know, ch culture can change people's lives. It doesn't happen overnight generally. But it's uh, mm. hurrah for Margaret. We take back everything we said about where you when you decried sci-fi as being talking squids in space. Um, so shall we go to something lighter? What do I, I do, what I do for J. fun? H. What are your what hobbies? Oh, Jesus. <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, I've also got, Over. I've also got um, oh, what's it's fine. the darkest publishing tale, if you'd rather. Can't possibly. Uh, actually, I can do. Actually, we'll do that one in a moment. Um, <laughs> but uh, what do I do for fun? I I read other books. I'm actually just, I managed to get away on holiday in Greece last week and I read a book a day for six days and that oh, was boy. tremendous. But I don't read sci-fi books because I'm working in sci-fi at the moment mm. and horror and stuff. So I was reading, my favourite book that I read last week was a uh, modern romantic comedy set in Paris uh, just because I was amazed that it gave me heart-stopping gasps of wonderment four times. And I'm not a, a big reader of romance, but I was totally smitten with this book called The Red Notebook, which is as cheesy as all get-go. They'll make it into a movie with Jennifer Aniston or something, but uh, and they'll ruin it. But um, I read a lot. I Over COVID, I've brushed up on my guitar. I ha I'm 60 next birthday, and I'm getting terrible arthritis. Uh, and I have gout, which also seizes things up. So I play guitar just to try and keep doing it. And over COVID, I brushed up my guitar tremendously and uh, I learned how to do cryptic crosswords and oh, all of these things are kind of kind of uh, preparing for retirement and death plainly but uh, <laughs> I, uh, my partner and I also uh, we walk a lot uh, we're mm. here in Nottingham we're 40 minutes from some of the best scenery in Europe uh, and although we decry it sometimes the Peak District and so on is forever new and forever mm -hmm. eternal and ancient and there's always another part to explore so we do a lot of that. So, but and the I, usual stuff. I got children, you know. Yeah. Um, I I used to sit opposite someone who could do cryptic crosswords, and she helped me over the course of this was years ago. Um, she's moved to the Netherlands now. Sadly, I miss her all the time. Um, and it, it was like uh, it's like a skill that you have to get 
but you will lose it. So you have to keep going. Yeah, right? indeed. There's a there's a bunch of great books about learning the skill. The one I would recommend is called uh, Two Girls, One on Each Knee. Okay. Brackets seven. <laughs> Uh, it's Pat and, De- a- Pat and Ella Patella. <laughs> and if you can work that out, uh, uh, then you don't need the book. Yeah. No, I couldn't work that out. My dad is amazing I needed at the book. crosswords, and he gets very frustrated with me because he tries to teach me how to do them. Mm-hmm. As I said, Abby and I used to do them together. but then It's the an metro, old person's game. It's an old person's game. Stopped, stopped mm-hmm. cryptic crosswords and put in Sudoku. I was Good. disgusted. Anyway. Well, it's a different style, and yeah, Sudoku no, and stuff is, is great. I quite like Sudoku too. It's the same puzzle again and again, though, and Cryptic Crosser is. is always different. Exactly, exactly. And like the personality of the setter creeps in. Yeah, we definitely. Meet or a carrier in the Guardian, or Paul in the Telegraph. Just extraordinary. Mm. Albie Fury, one of the great lost names oh, of Games wow, Workshop, yeah. who was the he was lead developer on Golden Heroes, Simon Burley's game. Uh, oh, he also uh, helped create Talisman. Uh, from the design that was sent in and a whole bunch of other games uh, and so on and kept White Dwarf going. Um, Ian and Steve's bet, right-hand man, big curly hair, if you see the South of Watford documentary with Ben Elton right, run, yeah. running the d game. He was also uh, set uh, the Evening Standard crossword. He was also he wrote oh. the definitive book on Rubik's Cube. He was a gamer <laughs> through and through as well. Yeah. It's all connected. I used to do the uh, the evening standard crossword in the few years I commuted in and out oh. of London. And you're right about the set of personality, because that one, I, I got inside his head and I knew, oh, this is an anagram. This is this. This is that you because of keywords that he put mm. in the clues. But then I tried the Times one and uh, <laughs> it was like starting again. Yeah. It's almost like how they used to do it with the Enigma machines, where they knew a certain left-handed German code operator was on, and that was the one they cracked uh, yes. because of the way they misspelt things. So it had to be a certain word and so on. Yeah, Absolutely fascinating. So. Apparently, I also study cryptography in my spare time. But, uh, I can't <laughs> talk we about that. <laughs> can't talk about that one, obviously. <laughs> um, so what is your dark? Oh, my heaven? goodness. You know, there are... There are books, particularly with Angry Robot, which is the more creator-owned uh, fiction line I created with HarperCollins and then ran independently with the help of Osprey, which is now run by other folks uh, after 11 years of that. And that was tremendous fun. I must show you this. I had this out for the other day. It's, uh, I have the really ugly face of H.P. Lovecraft sitting next to me today. This is the World Fantasy Award for setting up Angry Robot. And it's Garn Wilson, the, the amazing mm. uh, Golden Age cartoonist. And bit of a racist and a bit of a prick, but created so much amazing stuff with the Cthulhu mythos. So I keep him around annoyingly, uh, but uh, hes uh, I rub his head a lot for luck uh, and say, yeah, fuck you, fuck you all the time. But, um, <laughs> getting quite shiny. But uh, Angry Robot won't be amazing. But uh, as part of that, particularly by about year two and a half, year three, we'd won the Arthur C. Clarke Award with Lauren Bucas's Extraordinary Zoo City, and uh, we were up for a bunch of other awards and making quite a splash. And uh, we were getting sent amazing books, including a good dozen books that are now worldwide bestsellers, and I turned every single one of them down because I thought they were shockingly bad. Uh, And I can't (laughs) mention names because it's not fair. They just weren't my style. Um, yeah. In a couple of cases, they went to an editor who developed the books and turned them into into stuff. But my absolute worst publishing tale actually um, is someone. Who, it's about someone who remains a very good friend of mine, who at the time was uh, writing Black Library and doing comic strips and so on. And I was working with an editor. Um, this author was. Uh, we didn't want him to work on a project, but it was promised to him because he'd done the first part of it. Mm-hmm. And so I, I sent an email to my editor saying. I don't know, tell you what, invent a specious deadline, tell him it, and then he'll say, I'm too busy, and then he can drop off the product and it, project and it'll all be his fault. And my editor forwarded that email to him and his agent saying, here's what we're going to do. <laughs> uh, whereupon that agent didn't speak to me for six years, uh, boycotted oh, Angry Robot later. We're, we've uh, resolved all this years years later. And, uh, the uh, yeah, frankly, the agent used to be an editor and it's like, were you saying you, you never did any, any stunts like that. You never pulled any strokes or you never worked with an editor. who was a total dickhead. Uh, but uh, that was probably the, the most embarrassing thing, but yeah, darkest publishing tales. Publishing is a business and people forget that. Mm. <coughs> and it's also a creative process and egos do get tremendously involved. Mm. And there are people who think they can write, who, 
cannot, but our culture doesn't have a mechanism to tell them. It's funny, I like I say, I play guitar. Just because I sit here and twang away on my beat-up old whatever, uh, I don't immediately get my friends or my wife or uh, uh, my partner telling me, oh, you'll be playing the Albert Hall next week, but you write a novel. And yeah. everyone says, oh, you're going to get it published. You're going to be a bestseller. You're going to be J.K. Rowling. You're going to live in a big house. That's not how it works. Mm -hmm. Even if books are published, there's no chance you'll ever sell any copies beyond the 22 people you know and love, mm -hmm. and let alone being asked to do a second one and a third one. It's most ridiculously um, conflated process. Oh, writing a book, you'll be a bestseller. And at the same time, the other way around, you, I, I know there are published authors, and I've certainly had my name on plenty of things over the years, and as Graham has, uh, that you'll tell people, oh, yeah, I'm a writer, I'm an editor. Oh, ever had anything published? As if, well, surely it's all just fantasy. You're just, you go into your shed every night yeah. and you just, you're just, you're secretly it's, watching the snooker or something. It's but, not uh, a proper job. <laughs> yes. Yeah, exactly. Oh, yeah. So. And you have to be so careful with this stuff. And, you know, it's mm. a world of fantasy, but it shouldn't be in the, in the real world of publishing. But also, there's so many myths about publishing. You know, you hear it in the industry. Everyone bangs on about publishers making money. And I always ask the first question, well, out of every you know, £10 book, how much of that money goes to the shop? Oh, 50%. So actually, shops make the most money, but they take the risk of putting in your terrible book. So you then have a, uh, a job to be done helping to sell it. Well, I don't do my own marketing. That's what the publisher's for. Mm -hmm. There are ways and means of doing all this stuff, and there are many approaches, and publishing – uh, along with the music biz has been hit so much by digitization. Of course, we're also being hit by the sheer lack of paper. Europe is basically out of paper right yep. now. But uh, it's uh, that's challenging for Aconite at the moment. We, we print our books in the States, and I've got copies of amazing books like this one, Terraforming Mars. People are desperate to read this book, one of the be best board games out there, a great sci-fi novel. Not going to be in the UK till December, so that's, that was due out in August. Uh, but it's the way of the world post-COVID, and it's um, it's going to change a lot of things i think sorry I, i'm not I was there's doing no point some, at the end of this no i was well i was doing some um research and and um looking and i spotted that book and i thought a friend of mine would really like that book because she loves that game more than i don't know it's I would, I, like the hazard it's an guess, amazing game. game it's <laughs> all true it's all scientifically plausible which you really get in a game that's so approachable and can be wrapped up in a couple of hours Good and game. the people we work with on that Frix games wonderful it's a family of 10 swedish men and they also have a bunch of sisters. It's like one of the old school kind of religious families. And every one of them has a job. So one's the designer, one's the artist, one's the CEO, one that runs mail order, one runs the website. Wonderful, wonderful people to work with. Just the best. Um, if we're talking about books that aren't out in the UK, I must also draw attention to this one. Uh, not least because one of the gentlemen on the front, <laughs> I don't know if you know him at all, yeah. but uh, this is a fix up of some earlier novellas like, you know, uh, pre BL Jack Yeovil books. This is pre Aconite for, uh, mm. for, uh, Arkham Horror Fiction. And this is heading to shops shortly as well. I have to say playing with Arkham Horror has been an absolute joy working with people who know how to create that sense of the spooky and the uncanny in fiction that's based on a board game derived from a role-play game that's a dimly remembered uh, conflation of the Cthulhu mythos, which has been worked on by many thousands of people by now. Mm -hmm. It's uh, it's the new myth, isn't it, really? Cthulhu and so yeah. on. It's This is how it's Jesus similar. and uh, uh, the Greek myths and Sherlock Holmes, all all these mm -hmm. mythical creatures, Robin Hood, though I shouldn't show that, in, in mm -hmm. Nottingham, but yeah. uh, all these non-existent characters uh, who... Uh, Next one. The hounds of Tindalos are, are are terrifying to me. They're still terrifying to me. There's a short story about them, and and you know they come through like angles and corners. The, the corners of the in the corner oh. angles in the corner of the room. I used to know a girl like that. Yeah, and the short story at the end, just how they get into the room, is just horrible and terrifying, and I can't forget it. And I still, yeah, I I get scared easily. I don't watch much horror, put it that way. So I think but the best thing that Lovecraft the best thing that Lovecraft did was again, he wasn't writing in a tradition other than H. Ryder Haggard and yeah, he mm -hmm. knew that Howard was uh, you know, a couple of states away living in his mum's basement, similarly writing different things with Conan. And again, the early Conan stories are just weird beyond belief because he wasn't mm -hmm. following any things. But it's that sense of the uncanny and the sense that mm -hmm. this isn't your traditional myths. This is he's invented the mythos and yeah. that what the hellness about it is the thing that's yeah. kept it alive? To, to me, the most frightening thing about the entities of the Cthulhu mythos is that they're not evil. They're not out to yeah. do evil in the world. They just don't care. You are yep. as insects to mm. them. And I think yeah. 40K took a bit of that. Yeah, whatever happens, you will not be missed in the yeah. front of the very first 40K. 
that's where some of the Cthulhu stuff crept in because oh, yeah. we all synthesize it. We all put what well, we uh, find attractive or scary into the thing we're working on. Certainly, I'm like looking Woodruff. at all the angles in my room. Certainly, now, did. So <laughs> <laughs> well, you have to put mirrors in that uh, never quite reflect anything. Mm. Unless you play a lot of portal games, in which case you don't want to do that. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that is us. We are up at the end of our hour. That wow, was that went impact. quickly. Um, thank Easiest you so hour much. ever for me. Thank that you very much, amazing. Marco. <laughs> yeah, the best. You. You're welcome. <laughs> really and we'll do the years 1985 onwards next week. Is that what we're doing? Yeah, that would be great. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> <If we could. laughs> Thanks for all the great questions, everyone. Yeah, thank you, yep. everyone who's watching, and we will see you all for into the rook inside the rookery. I don't know why I said into the rookery inside the rookery next Saturday, which is a special episode Birthday. because it is a year since we incorporated as a company. So yeah. we will hopefully see you all then. Cheers Have a to lovely that. Saturday. Bye, Bye, everyone. Good evening. Bye-bye. <laughs>